Pinaghapon ko sa bangat siya. Thank you for spending your Thursday afternoon with us. I'm J.P. Sylvester from the Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and Psychology, and it is my privilege to host today's lecture series. In celebration of Women's Month and the College of Social Sciences Week, the College of Social Sciences Lecture Series Committee and the UPB Casariad Program welcomes you to this lecture series entitled Philosophy, Politics, and Society. Women in Soxai, Soxai by Women. So I appreciate everyone's presence this afternoon. Let us welcome our Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Baguio, Dr. Carzan Abaz. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Professor Lea Abayao, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences, faculty members, distinguished lecturers, students, and guests. A pleasant afternoon to all of you. This year's National Women's Month celebration marks a milestone as the Philippine Commission on Women launches a new returning team from this year to 2028. We for gender equality and inclusive society. Coinciding with this national celebration is the celebration of the College of Social Sciences Week, which formally opened last Monday. And so, it's only but fitting that we gathered here today for this twofold celebration by holding this grand lecture series that celebrates the works of women in the social sciences. Hence, their team, Women in Soxai, Soxai by Women. As mentioned in the rationale of this event, this lecture series aims to raise our consciousness about the importance and contribution of women thinkers in the study of philosophy, politics, and society. We are venue to reflect about the underrepresentation of women in the academy and initiate the diversification of the academic canon of the social sciences and philosophy. Let this event be an opportune moment for all of us to recognize the invaluable contributions by women in the social sciences and philosophy. To our distinguished lecturers this afternoon, the women of some science. Thank you for taking up the noble task of sharing your insights on selected women thinkers and how their thought contributes to our understanding of society and the human condition. May your brief lecture eventually inspire all of us to take up and read the works of these women scholars. Of course, to the College of Social Sciences and the UPB Casarian Program. Thank you for organizing and gathering all of us to this momentous occasion. Finally, to all students, faculty and guests, thank you for your presence and for your support to this event. And so I formally welcome you all, every one of you, to this philosophy, politics, and society lecture series, Women in Soxai, Soxai by Women. Mabuhay ang Soxai, mabuhay ang kababaihan. Maraming salamat po, Chan Sikora, for emphasizing that this event recognizes the work of women and it's in celebration of the power of women. Now let us proceed to the lecture proper. We will have five equally important talks and we invited five distinguished guests. Each speaker will have approximately 20 minutes to pitch their respective subjects and the Q&A will be followed after the fifth presenter. We will accommodate as much questions as possible, so please note your questions as we go along, and we will also have a health break in between. With that said, let me introduce the first speaker. Our first speaker received her BA in Philosophy from the Ateneo de Manila University, where she worked on an undergraduate thesis on Iris Marian Young's Feminist Phenomenology. She has taught a course on ethics in UP Baguio, and her research interests include feminist theory, phenomenology, and existentialism. Joining us via Zoom, let us welcome Ms. Amanda Nicole Caliante sharing on Iris Marion Young on menstrual meaning making.
Sige. So I hope you guys can see this. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and I'll start. Huh? So I guess just to begin, um, I want to give like a quick uh, introduction and some context about um, Iris Marion Young. So Iris Marion Young was an American thinker who was born on January 2nd, 1949. She is known for her work on political theory as well as feminist theory. Uh, she grew up in New York and received her master's degree and doctorate degree in philosophy from Pennsylvania State University. Uh, she worked as a professor in many universities, including the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Chicago, and many others. Uh, so Young incorporated a lot of personal experience in her academic work, which is evident in much of her writing. So for instance, um, she and her family were heavily affected after the passing of her father and consequently being placed in foster care after the state deemed her mother unfit for care for her and her siblings. So um, this is an experience that she covers among her essays that examines the role of homemaking mm -hmm. as one traditionally associated with women. Um, but really this is just one example of how much of Young's work was rooted in the perspective of feminist theory. And sadly, um, Iris Young passed away at only 57 years old mm -hmm. on August 1st, 2006, after battling with cancer. Um, but Young has been able to make significant contributions to contemporary theories of justice and feminist political theory, as well as the phenomenology to the study of embodiment and the embodied experience, which we will be talking about today. So I came across Young's work as I was coming up with a topic for my undergraduate thesis a few years ago. Um, and I remember complaining to my friend one day about Descartes, of all people, um, after our modern philosophy class. I was complaining about his fixation um, on the mind as it seemed to be the ultimate reflection of the self. And I kept wondering and asking, what about the body though? Because I don't think, or I didn't think at the time, that the body and likewise its experiences are negligible or to be dealt with as something that we simply have to overcome and disregard. Um, but neither would the mind-body the distinction that the modern philosophers relied so heavily on um, seem to serve as a solution or a realistic way to examine the human condition, especially if that human was one whose body informed so much of herself, or in other words, was somebody who was female and somebody who was woman. So I was sifting through the files on my Google Drive one day and I came across a copy of Iris Marion Young's book entitled on female body experience, which had been shared with me by the philosophy disciplines of Ms. Dan Adina, who had been my professor for my philosophy of the human condition in the track of phenomenology um, when I was an undergraduate. So uh, the book on female body experience is a collection of essays by Young, published over the course of a little over two decades, um, each centering around a particular aspect of a woman's lived bodily experience as female. Um, I read Young's work and I found it extremely engaging it was very clear, it was so rich, um, and it spoke to me in a way that went beyond my academic utilitarian need for a thesis topic. Um, Young's work was exactly what I had been looking for, and really more than I could have hoped for, or hoped to find. And just like that, um, I had the groundwork and the finger for my topic, for my undergraduate thesis. Um, so let's talk about traditional phenomenology, um, which is the study of phenomena. So when it comes to traditional phenomenology, um, it is also important that we pay attention to embodiment, which recognizes that the human person is not simply made up of mind or soul, with bodies acting as vessels that contain that subject. Um, but instead, the human person is understood precisely as an embodied consciousness or as an embodied subject. So our involvement in and inhabiting of the world cannot be possible without embodied experience. The world itself is lived and experienced through this body. Um, I encounter and I inhabit the intersubjective world with other beings like myself. So the body for young and other existential phenomenologists is not simply an object possessed by a subject, but intertwined and constitutive of a person's subjectivity. It is necessary then to account for our lived bodily experiences when we consider the human condition. What it means now to speak of female bodily experience is to consider these bodily experiences as affected by one's biological sex and, by extension, by one's gender. So this is where Young identifies a gap in traditional phenomenology, a gap where we find a lack of discussion and perspective of the body as sex and as gender. 
So Maurice Ward Hornby, another thinker, um, had a concept of an anonymous body. So it is what we can think of as envisioned and interpreted as being a standard body. So it is one that is meant to encompass all people. Um, it is a model of a body that is free personal, that serves as a kind of universal body. So he describes this body as one characterized by certain qualities and abilities like transcendence, intentionality, and unity. He describes this body as one in which the subject experiences and exercises a kind of mobility and spatiality that facilitate an open quality that reaches out beyond the immediate body into the world. So Yang asserts, however, that he experiences qualities and abilities that Merle Pondi identifies and associates with the anonymous universal body are not consistent with and not fully representative of many women's lived bodily experiences. So the major flaw now of the anonymous body lies in its promotion of a standard that more closely resembles a body that is male as opposed to one that is female. For the female body now, um, deviates from an established standard and where sex and gender, while not determining but are indeed closely linked, appear to perpetuate women's supposed otherness. Young considers an account of female embodiment, though, undertaken by Simone de Beaufort, which is examined and criticized in many of her essays. So Young credits the Bois as acknowledging and making some of the first attempts really to fill the sex and gender by the gap of existential phenomenology, um, Beauvoir considered bodily experiences particular to and undergone by many women alongside her situation in a patriarchal society. And while making some progress in the recognition of female specificity, Beauvoir's written work and out of the female body and her experiences are still decidedly negative echoing sentiments of a normative male-centered concept with the embodied consciousness and human condition. So the disdain for the female body is manifested, most especially in the description of the menstrual process. So it's important to note now that not all women undergo menstruation, nor are all menstruating people necessarily considered to be women, but focusing on a process such as menstruation can serve um, as the foundation for a discourse that many women may be able to relate to and further contribute to, given that it is a physiological process that many women undergo. Um, but some of the criticisms that Young raised regarding the was account of female embodiment and description of menstruation include the following. Um, firstly, that the ideal situation um, Beauvoir envisions when it comes to an account of embodiment is one that does away with sexual independence or one sex and gender does not point to a significant distinction between others' bodily experiences. And secondly, it denigrates the female body, exhibited in the connection she makes between the menstrual process and one's experience of her own period. So, for instance, um, Beauvoir speaks of shame that seems naturally and automatically to appear alongside a girl's first experience of menstruation. She describes the body using terms such as obscure and alien during one's period. And in the very same breath that she asserts that woman can identify with the body, that it makes up a part of her subjectivity, it is somehow simultaneously something that escapes her still. And according to Young, it is for one's emphasis on the physical limitations undergone by a woman during her period that works in a way that symbolizes woman's position and situation within a patriarchal society. Um, in one way or another, Beauvoir's resignation, when it comes to menstruation to the menstruating female body, appears to reinforce the belief and idea that whatever constructed social cultural markers of inferiority of both imposed on women could be attributed to and maybe even justified by a natural given aspect of one's being woman or female, of her biological capacity as a menstruating person. Young, however, asserts that the experience most girls have in regards to menstruation and feminine maturation is that of ambivalence, of mixed feelings, and also of a kind of experience where one um, where one feels as though they are split and alienated. Beauvoir's depiction of menstruation, albeit dramatic, <laughs> is not an unfounded evaluation and description of many women's menstrual experiences. Um, it's not uncommon for women to experience their periods as painful, messy inconveniences, 
many grown and holding at the onset of their monthly cycles. And until now, I can go on social media and see people who echo that sentiment that our anthropomorphized uh, reproductive system seem to complain and punish us um, for the absence of a fertilized egg. Um, you know, that's set to grow into a baby eventually. Um, many women dread the period of menstruation. I, I know I did when I was younger. Um, I absolutely hated the time of month when I would have to prop myself up in a sitting position um, at night to sleep just to prevent staining the bed sheet. Um, many women, especially women who have particularly heavy periods, constantly worry about the possibility of blood leaking through their clothes. Many women are also troubled by physical pain during their periods. And there are very real experiences of discomfort, of anxiety, and inconvenience that accompany menstruation. And Young is not one to shy away from considering such experiences in her account of the female body. However, uh, many negative notions and experiences of menstruation are also fueled by the association of menstruation with shame. Young considers how shame is reinforced in women by much of society. She asserts that women are made to conceal their, their menstrual function and experiences made to observe social rules, a kind of menstrual etiquette that situates women and her particular bodily functions and experiences as something to be controlled and hidden from the rest of society. Should it ever happen that any indication of a woman's period be made known, she experiences a degree of shame, feeling as if a secret, a quiet, deeply personal part of herself has been revealed against her wishes. I recall an instance when I was a pre-adolescent um, when I was with my friends at the mall, um, a sealed sanitary napkin got out of my bag on the ground beside me. And I still remember how we all froze, literally froze. <laughs> and my friend was looking back and forth between me and the napkin with this bewildered expression on her face. And I felt so embarrassed. I felt the weight of embarrassment appear almost instantly knowing that these complete strangers walking past us could see the pad, look at it, look at me, and make this connection that I, a young girl, was guilty of being on my period. I felt the shame weighing down heavier and heavier on me as I bent down to pick up the pad and throw it back in my bag. <laughs> and even more so was the shame and humiliation that I felt when I bled through my white feeling uniform during our graduation ceremony in seventh grade in front of all my batchmates and their families. Feelings of shame that are linked to one's being a menstruator, according to Young, are further reinforced by the institutional non-acceptance of such a physiological function with workplaces or schools failing to provide adequate facilities or, consider or consideration for students or employees who may be menstruating. Much of society's treatment of women as menstruators, though willing to acknowledge this function, imposes expectations onto them, pressuring them to conceal this process, process sorry, expecting them still to work and move in such a way that an outsider would not be able to tell that they were currently on their periods or that they could be experiencing some physical limitations due to their monthly cycle. Many women also experience um, ridicule that is targeted towards them by other people with accusations that she is on her period, that she displays any negative or strong emotions. And in many ways, society plays, uh, places much of the responsibility onto women to hide their being menstruators, thus fostering an environment and context wherein women may begin to blame their bodies, um, their menstruating function as the very root of such shame and negative, degrading interpretations of being female. So it's not difficult for one to experience social and cultural shame and dread in the public sphere and really to end up internalizing that shame and dread, experiencing it even in her own privacy. What are the consequences now of internalizing these attitudes of administration? First, it appears that it would perpetuate the inferior status of women, of women imposed on us by the patriarchy. And second, it maintains a kind of existential and ontological separation that plagues men and women. Overwhelming feelings of shame and dread of negative menstruation can cause or encourage a sense of alienation from the body. One may come to understand her period as a time when she is not herself, as she loses a degree of control over her body, unable to stop, minimize, or time the flow of blood. She can begin to feel betrayed by the body, 
that undergoes pain in the form of headaches, stomach aches, dysmenorrhea, vomiting, and the like. Um, and she might feel as though her body is punishing her, that she is, in one way or another, a victim. It is as if the body now transforms itself into an object to be carried around and endured for a few days or a week out of the month. The phenomenological conviction that our bodies are a necessary and inextricable part of our subjectivity are challenged and become lost on the woman who feels and interprets her menstruating body, mainly body mainly as an inconvenience and obstacle to herself. The self is experienced as a part from this body. And there is, however, truth and authenticity to be found in accounts of menstruation that acknowledge the pain and discomfort and annoyance that come with it. Um, but in a, and in a phenomenological sense, um, Beauvoir actually isn't wrong to offer her description of the menstrual experience, but she stops merely at those descriptions, resigning us to instead wait until life and her bodies take its natural course, reaching menopause when we can finally be free from the shackles of our reproductive functions. What Young is critical of lies in Beauvoir's inability to move past those overly negative and accusatory denigrations of menstruation and of the female body. So what does call I sorry, what does Young call for now in lieu of such an attitude? Young prompts us to reconsider the ways we regard the menstrual process and our menstrual experiences. Not necessarily um, the glorification of menstruation, but the glorification of the female in her body. Because at a certain point, um, instead of embracing menstruation, um, making it out to be a blessed, otherworldly, beautiful process can be disingenuous, removed from our lived experiences of it. And in her essay, Menstrual Meditations, Young says that the transvaluation of values isn't likely. Likewise, I think that a reevaluation of menstruation would really call for a more realistic account of this female body experience, one that does not deny the inconvenience, the discomfort, and neither does it, or neither would it, exaggerate these experiences that arise alongside menstruation or conflate them as justifications for women's subordination to men. Young's invitation to shift our perception of menstruation from being monstrous and instead to being mundane is a shift that is possible without completely divorcing our understanding and perception of menstruation from our actual lived experiences of it. Young offers a good starting point for the reevaluation of menstruation, where she considers the relationship of menstruation and mood emphasizing what she finds to be the reflective possibilities that lie in the lived experience of menstruation. One's mood is something that appears to arise out of nowhere. Um, it is not directed nor caused by any particular object, and yet it affects our complete being in the world. It influences the way I experience things and live, and the experience of menstruation lends itself to a certain kind of mood for many women. Not so much moodiness that we usually imagine when considering one's time of the month, um, but a kind of existential and ontological mood that can color our lives and our personal lived experiences. Considered now as something normal and a part of many women's embodied experiences, I think what, is, what it is that is emphasized about menstruation is how it can give shape to a woman's life and how it affects um, our experience of time. Menstruation, Young says, carries a unique temporal quality um, for those who experience it. And for many people, menstruation serves as an important marker of maturity and growth. Um, it can also, or menstruation in its cyclical routine nature, um, also becomes a marker, even for the more ordinary and regular passage of time for us. Many women use the timeline of their periods to organize memory of certain events. You might hear somebody say, no, no, I, I remember that because when it happened, there was on my period. Um, and many other women also account for menstruation um, when they make plans for the future. Uh, so this reevaluation of menstruation would accomplish the following. Um, we would be able to consider experiences of the female body and that while sharing and, and that while sharing, I mean in the general quality with the male body has its own particularities that must be considered in light of the uneven treatment of that which is female, feminine, and of woman in a patriarchal society. So it considers the nuance of sexual difference as well as specificity, which cannot be ignored in the face of sex and gender-based discrimination. Next, 
That serves to remedy feelings of shame and alienation experienced by many women. Someone who is able to interpret and experience their body and all its functions realistically and honestly will learn not only to endure and come to terms with the body, but fully accept and experience the body as part of the self. So the menstruating body is no longer thought of as a monthly separation of myself from my body or a problem and burden that acts as an obstacle to be overcome. The menstruating body, that is the female body, is one that informs my lived experiences, my own particularities, and is an important part of my subjectivity. And hopefully, women can come to experience their periods as what they are, can represent and interpret them authentically as it is experienced, and likewise experience and interpret their bodies as myself. So ultimately, I think the ways we are invited to reconsider menstruation can be considered a kind of meaning making, where we take up the task of assigning and designating meaning to our menstrual experiences, where the shift to understand menstrual or sorry menstruation as mundane uh, does not mean that it has to become unimportant or meaningless to us. Um, mundane experiences can carry significant value and weight to them, so long as we, the subjects, uh, assign meaning to them. The woman responsible for creating and assigning meaning to her bodily experiences and functions will play an active role in the determination of values as well um, as in self-determination. These meanings that she is to make will now point towards the horizon of possibilities that opens to her as a free autonomous subject. But really, I think one of the most um, valuable things that can be taken from Young's work really is her candor, her sincerity to try and illustrate a picture of female of a female kind of body experience. Um, the relationship that we have with our bodies and the understanding we have of the body deserve our attention and then the continuous effort, I think, to push back against the patriarchy and against misogyny um, in our having to demand a place for women and to work towards a reality in society where women can live, can live authentically. Uh, women need a sense of belonging and security to return to. So the social political goals of the feminist project also include and can be better supported by women who experience themselves and the personal as belonging to them and as a realm wherein they are free to enact their agency as embodied subjects. So the female body is not something that we function and live in spite of, but is that through which our living and existing is made possible. The body is the site, or the body is thus a site for the liberating enactment of our subjectivity that is reclaimed, rehabilitated, reinterpreted, reinterpreted by ourselves, for ourselves. So another important idea that we could take from Young is um, the social and political aspect of her work. But um, having thought about it could really extend this lecture. So I invite you instead to read more about this part of her work if ever you are interested. And with that, I want to offer just a short reading list um, for all of you. So if you're interested in learning more about or reading about uh, female bodily experience, you can read um, on female body experience with so the book that I was talking about earlier, um, as well as the book Dancing with Iris, which was published um, kind of as a tribute to her after she passed away. Um, and I guess to end my lecture with you all right now, I just want to share um, one of my favorite lines by Young um, that goes, however alienated male-dominated culture makes us from our bodies, and however much it gives us instruments of self-hatred and oppression, still our bodies are ourselves. Iris Young. Thank you.